say tonight is, is a very simple message. Uh, I'm not going to get very deeply involved in the subject, but the point I want to make is uh, quite profound, and I hope you'll pick up on it uh, and, and learn from it. I want to start by asking what a promise is. Who knows what a promise is? Yes, Daniel. Right, okay, so you can promise not to do something or you can promise to do something. Is it, is it important that you keep your promise? Yeah. It is. Right, you're absolutely right. Um, can I ask a question if, if anybody here has had a, a promise from Andrew Bailey? Nobody got a promise from Andrew Bailey? I'm surprised. Who is, Who is? Ah, that's a good question. Who is Andrew Bailey? Well, here's a promise from Andrew Bailey. Now you know who he is, don't you? He's the chief cashier of the Bank of England. On every one of our banknotes, it says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of, in this case, £20. Um, I don't usually have one of those in my notes, but I stole it from Lady earlier on this afternoon. And she's going to want it back later. <laughs> right, so now you know who An uh, um, Andrew Bailey is. Does Mr. Bailey keep his promise? Has anybody ever known Mr. Bailey not to keep that promise? You have? When? A defaced one. Right, yes you can. In the case of a forfeit or, or a badly defaced, the number's missing and it's been tampered with, then the promise becomes null and void. It is dependent on us looking after his promise, isn't it? So there are occasions when that promise might not be honoured. Usually it's in the case of a forged note, and they're usually of the higher value, aren't they? But you, you can imagine what would happen if Mr. Bailey suddenly decided that he was no longer going to honour his promise to pay what he says he will on each of those banknotes. The country would come to a standstill, wouldn't it? So, genuine notes are always honoured if they're in respectable, reasonable condition, that they can be recognised for what they really are, uh, and it's very important that they are. So that's one sort of promise that is very easy to see, is important that it's kept, because the lives of all of us would be affected if the Bank of England, England decided that they were no longer going to honour that promise. Do we make promises? Anybody here make promises? Right? How about, give me an example of a promise that you might have made. Anybody? Oh, you see, I'm thinking of things like, I promise to go and tidy my room when I get home tonight so that mum doesn't have to do it. I mean, is that the sort of promise you boys might make? It would depend on the reward that was offered, wouldn't it? How about I promise to go and tidy dad's room so that mum doesn't have to do it when I get home? You know, you can make all sorts of promises but it depends on whether you can keep the promise as to whether you really mean it or not. And, and it is important that we keep our promises when we promise to do something. So we can promise to be in a certain place at a certain time. But because we're human, sometimes events overtake us and we can't keep that promise. Perhaps that says that we should also always say something like, God willing, if I am able to, I will keep this promise. But, but of course, if something happens, I'll try and let you know first. Um, but there are promises which are very important to keep. I mean, would you promise to be kind to your brothers and sisters at home? Always. It's not, it's not easy to do, is it? But it's something that really we should be in, in our daily living. Another type of a promise is when we promise to pay for goods if we order them from a company and they're sent to us and we say you send me the goods and I'll send you the money when you give me the invoice and I'll pay it. Uh, and a lot of us in the room make that sort of a promise. In fact we are asked sometimes uh, to give a, um, a sign of good faith that we will do that and that's called giving a deposit. We have to put perhaps 10 or 20 percent down of its value before the supplier will send it to us. And that in a sense is a promise. And the scripture deals with promises like that because it, when it talks about the promises of God, the scriptures talk about we us receiving the earnest of the promise. 
And that really means the deposit. God gives us a deposit, a sign of good faith that he will keep his promises to us. Uh, and of course the, the sign of good faith that we've been given is Jesus. That he came and he lived and he was crucified and raised again and he becomes the first fruits of those who sleep. And so that is, is that sort of where a deposit's been paid for a promise that God's made, made to us. Would those that you make a promise to on something be likely to believe you that you would do it? Do you think? Would your dad believe you if you said, I promise to do something? There's a shaking of head coming over there. <laughs> it, it depends on the experience that people have had of you, doesn't it? If people know by experience that every time you say, I promise I will do that, you always do it when you say you'll do it, They've got confidence to believe that you will do it. But that's something that's learned in life. So promises, uh, it, it is very important that we keep our promises. Uh, it's more important when the promise is being made to you, isn't it? If somebody promises to do something for you, you're going to look forward to that promise being honoured. I mean, supposing I made a promise here and now to everyone, say, under the age of 18 years of age, do you think I would keep it? Who thinks I, I would keep it? Who thinks I wouldn't? Right? <laughs> There's one or two, you see? It depends on what the promise is, doesn't it? I mean, if I promised to give every person under the age of 18 at the end of this meeting one million pounds, you'd be very silly to believe me. Because I haven't got the resources to give any one of you a million pounds, let alone all of you. But, of course, it, it would be unrealistic and impossible for me to honour that sort of a promise. How about if I promise to let everyone who is under the age of 18 in this room tonight to have a share in a box of Thornton's chocolates? at the end of this meeting. Who believes I would be able to keep that promise? Oh, there's some hands going up now, isn't there? Is there anybody who thinks I wouldn't keep that promise? <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> Daniel, don't you like chocolates? Well, <laughs> but you don't think I would be able to give you a thoughts and thoughts chocolates again? We'll see how it goes on. You see, you see what I said earlier, that when you make a promise, it's all dependent on whether you're able to fulfill the promise. But God gives us good reason to believe him. And so I need to give you good reason to believe that I could give you a share in a box of Thornton's chocolates, couldn't I? Shouldn't I? Otherwise, there's no reason why you should believe me. Well, I want Ben Harper to come out here now, because I've got a reason for that. <laughs> Can you come out, Ben? Because in my case here, guess what I've got? A nice brand new box of Thornton's chocolates. Now, Ben put his hand up and he said he believed me. I think he did. I'm hoping you did. I've got, I've got to open this. You see, it's brand new. It's not me. Sorry? Is it empty? Ah, well, that's the point, you see. It's no good me showing you an empty box. So we're going to open this. And I thought there are two layers. And there. Other thorns and chocolates. I was hoping Emily and Abigail were going to be here because these are all gluten free as well, so they got <laughs> so they're not here. I'm going to ask Ben to look after this box of chocolates until the end of the day. <laughs> right? Now I have confidence in Ben that he's not going to scoff them all during the meeting. Thank you, Ben. If you'd like to go and sit down there and look after that box of chocolates, there's a lesson to be learned there. Right. Now then, I just Knocked all my link notes off of there. Right. So you need firstly to know that I'm able to keep my promise. You have to have sufficient confidence in me that I do keep my promises. Uh, and those who know me will know that I do try to keep my promises because when I promise something, I do take it very seriously indeed. And you also know need to know that there is a condition attached to the promise. You see, you only get to share in that box of chocolates 
if you believe, I will let you have the chocolates. How do you feel now, Daniel? Do you believe that I could let you have a share in the chocolates or not? Yeah, well, he's changed his mind now, you see. So Daniel's changed his mind because he's seen the evidence uh, that the, the chocolates are there, and I've handed them to somebody who can be trusted to share them out afterwards. Right, at least I hope he's not like his dad, because his dad was uh, drooling over the thoughts of these chocolates yesterday when I was talking to him. Right. So that's the promise. I promise to let everyone under the age of 18 years share in a box of Thornton's chocolates if you believe that I will keep that promise. If you don't believe, then don't bother to go to the chocolates because Ben won't let you have one. But so far, I think, how many? Have we got eight hands showing here? How many hands up if you think you'll get one? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes, he nearly tried it. Okay. Right. Where are we? Now then, what has all this thing got to do with God's promises which you can share? Well, in a sense, we've just acted out a little parable, haven't we? Let's see how that works in Scripture. Let's see if we can put the bits together. We have to accept that we are human and we are mortal and we can't guarantee with absolute certainty that we can keep our promises. But you can with God. You see, I don't know if before the end of the meeting something disaster will overtake this country and we're no longer here and I can't finish the meeting. I mean, supposing a, 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 an engine fell off an aeroplane and came through and killed a lot of us. Horrible thought. <laughs> see, but you, my promise would then not aim would be kept, wouldn't it? But failing those sort of disasters, then my promise should be able to be kept. Right, second to Peter that we read, and chapter one. Follow when Uncle Jim was reading that. Reading earlier. Verses 3 and 4. Peter says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Sorry, I've read verse 2 there. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be, might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So what Peter has told us there is, we are subject to corruption. We know that one day we will get older, we will die and go into the grave, and then we will corrupt and go back to the dust, because that's what scripture says happens, and we know by experience. That happens to all of us. But there's a way out of that, and that's part of God's promises. Which Peter says, God's given us exceeding great and precious promises. And we want to look at what those are. Now then, who has, made, who has God made promises to in the Bible? Who can give us some names? Yes, Daniel. Moses. Moses. Right, let's write up Moses. Shout some more out if you can. Right, more? Anybody? Daniel. Daniel, yeah, all right, Daniel. Isaac. Isaac. Yeah? Jacob. Jacob. <laughs> Noah. Noah. Somebody said? Right? Yeah. David, thank you. Right, that, that'll do. A whole load of people who God has given made promises to. Right, we're going to look now in a moment to see what those promises are. In fact, we'll go straight to that. What promises did God make to these people? Let's see if you can pick out some of the things that God promised them. Let's write that on another sheet. What did God promise these people? Anything? Anybody? Yes? Um, he promised Daniel to... Um, he promised... Uh, to Daniel that he could save him from the lions. Right, he could save him from the lions. Certainly did that, he did that last night. Right, save from lions. Right, 
Anybody, any, anything else from anybody? Something that God promised these people that we saw on that other sheet. What did he promise Abraham? Land. Sorry? Land? Right, brilliant. Land. Yes? Forever. Forever. <laughs> Right. He wouldn't flood the world again. Wouldn't flood the world, that was to Noah. No flood again. Right. The son to David. Son to David. That's quite an important one, isn't it? Right. Any others? Yes. Those many descendants as the stars. That's what I got on my sheet. Um, Descendants. I just thought, but we know it means as as no, stars in the sky and the sea, sand on the seashore for multitude, wasn't it? Anything else? God's promised anybody? Eternal life. Eternal life. Who said that? Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. That's a major point of my uh, what we've got to say. So I'm glad somebody said that. Uh, yes. Sorry? Abundance of food. Abundance of food, yeah. Psalm 72. No more floods. We, we've got that. Uh, no flood again. Right. Well, there, there's a few things that we've got. Um, we've got land. We've got a kingdom. We've got people and blessings that go with those people. And we've got everlasting life or eternal life, as the scripture often calls it. Um, Whereabouts in Scripture do we read about those then? Well, I'm not going to ask you to shout those out, I'll tell you. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Let's have a look at some of these promises that God has made. And God doesn't actually say, I promise that, as we would say, because God says, I will do this, and he means it. Because God cannot lie. Scripture says that, and we'll come to that in a minute. But Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3 the Lord has said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that curse thee, bless thee and I will curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's an amazing promise, isn't it, that God made to Abraham at this time. Uh, that's our first introduction, really, to Abraham, apart from his, a bit of his genealogy in the, third, the previous few verses of chapter 11. But here we have a promise that God has made to this man called Abraham. And what God promised him, ultimately, comes right down to us, as we'll show in a minute, that we can have a share in that promise. Look at chapter 13. We said, land, didn't we? Land forever. Um, Jim Abbey. Mm -hmm. Chapter 13 and verse... 14. Who would like to read this? I bet Daniel would like to read it. Come out and read this for us, Daniel. Thank you. Chapter 14, and that's 13. There to there in the bed. That's it, yes. Lift up from the lift up lift up now thine eyes and look it from the place where thou art, northward and southward, and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee, I will give it, and to thy seed for ever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and and the bread is of it, for I will give it unto thee. Thank you. Very well read, wasn't it? Right. So, there's, there's the promise that God made to Abraham. He said, everything you can see, I will give it to you. And to your seed forever. Right. Let's go now over, and we're going to jump right over to David now, to 2 Samuel chapter 7. We'll come back to this in a minute. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 16. Does anybody like to read that for us? <coughs> no? Right, all heads down, so I'll read it for you then. 
Nobody has, has to read if you don't want to. Right. Verse 12 in 2 Samuel 7. God is here speaking through his prophet to David the king. And he says, When thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And there's the part of that promise that Uncle Jim said, that it was a land forever, and it's a kingdom forever. Because David was a descendant of Abraham. And he was now king over God's people, Israel. And when God says, I will give you this land forever, he was promising it to David as a descendant of Abraham. But of course, there will come a time when Abraham will share that too, uh, which we believe. Uh, but that's something to come on in a moment. John chapter 3, the Gospel of John now, verse uh, 15. You see, in that verse we read in Samuel, it said about David's son reigning forever. And of course, we know that that is Jesus. He was the greatest son of David, and he is the one who will reign on David's throne forever. And what did Jesus say to Nicodemus, the Pharisee, who came to him one night? He says, verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Right. Now then, that's the promise that God made, that whoever believes in Jesus will have eternal life, or everlasting life. Do you see where the, the lesson we learned earlier, that if you make a promise that's based on whether you believe or not, that's quite important that you do believe or you don't get the promise. That was the point of that little parable we worked out. It's because I need you to believe that I will let you have those chocolates that Ben's got at the end of this meeting. And if you don't believe I'll do it, you won't, you won't get them. Well, God says exactly the same thing. He says, believe in my son and I'll give you eternal life. And that's the, the crux of the matter when it comes to a promise that God's made that we can all share in. Because we can share the promises that God has made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to David and all the faithful people down through history. Now the question is, does God keep his promises? Who's going to answer that one? Daniel again? Yes. Right. He does, right? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. And we see first the important piece in this chapter that we have to believe God. God feels that that is very, very important that we believe him. Hebrews 11 verse 6. Faith is all about believing, having faith, isn't it? Verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Exactly the same pattern as we worked out earlier with that box of chocolate, you see. You've got to believe to be able to get the reward. And God's offering something far greater than a box of chocolate, which just gives us temporary enjoyment. He's giving us something we're going to enjoy forever. Eternal life. Right, so we must believe, A, that he is, and B, he will reward the believers. How about verse 13 of this chapter? Have a look at that. Now then, let's ask Nathan if he can explain that. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. So does God not keep his promises, Nathan? I think so. 
It does, right? So how does that apply then? How does that work? Thank you. Yes, because Uncle Jim mentioned it earlier, didn't he, in it, when he introduced that seventh hymn. It's resurrection. It's God has got something in store for those who will trust him. So he hadn't forgotten his promises that he made to these people. There's a reason why he didn't keep that promise there and then. It's because he intends to keep it later on. And Hebrews 11 goes on to talk about lots of other people who likewise had great faith in God and believed him. And yet they never received the promise. Look at verse 39 of this chapter. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, you see, they believed, they had faith, they believed, received not the promise. Why? Well, you look on. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. And that is the reason why Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and all the others in Hebrews 11 and all through Scripture haven't yet received God's promise. Because God's waiting for you and me. And when he is ready, he will send Jesus back, and then he will fulfill his promise and all those he's promised, he will give eternal life, and a kingdom, and land, all the things that he said he will do. So all of us can share in his promises. And we can share in one promise in particular. Can we just beyond Hebrews into the letters of John? And we're looking at 1 John chapter 2. <coughs> Verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. Now you can't get much clearer than that, can you? That God has promised us eternal life. Peter says it's true. And Peter believed Jesus, and he is assured of placing God's kingdom. Let's look at chapter 5 and verse 11. And this is the record that God had given to us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he, hath not, he that hath not the Son not life. So there's part of the conditions. You've got to have Jesus in your life properly, haven't you? As God and as Jesus want you to be in order to share in God's promise. Go back a few chapters to 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 17. Paul says to Timothy, charge them as a rich in this world that be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich, may be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. And that is the promise that we can have from God. Go back to John chapter 3 again, which we looked at just now. And uh, verse 15 and 16 we've just read, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see, if you haven't got Jesus in your life, if you don't believe Jesus, then the promise isn't open to us. Verse 36 of this chapter now then, because we've read the other ones. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. There's the two sides of the equation, you see. So those who don't believe, the wrath of God is upon them. But those who do believe, God will give them eternal life in his kingdom when Jesus comes back. And finally, in this little section, Titus, if you can find it, it's just before Tim, um, Hebrews. Titus chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2. 
Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, have promised before the world began. You see, the promises of God have existed through all time for anybody who believes in him. Adam and Eve, you remember, in the garden, were told, don't touch of that tree, because if you do, you'll die. And they didn't believe God. And they touched it. And they're dead. But God says, you believe in me, and I'll bring you through to my kingdom. These are promises that God has made that every single one of us can share. That God will keep his promise is sure and absolute. For us to share in those promises, though, it is down to us. It is down to the way we respond to God and to Jesus, his son. He asks us to believe in him. He asks us to believe in Jesus. Do you remember that God promised a land to Abraham and his descendants, and when Abraham's descendants left the land of Egypt, about 400 years after that promise was made, they were travelling to what was called the Promised Land, a land which was said to be flowing with milk and honey, a wonderful place. And when they're on their way on the journey, Moses sends 12 spies. Do you remember the story of the 12 spies who went out into the land and they came back? And what happened when they came back? Anybody remember? Yes, Daniel? They had uh, two bunches of grapes. They had two massive grapes, bunches of grapes, didn't they? Yes. What else? What, did, what happened with their report that they gave to Moses? Did they say, it's a great place, we've got to get there quick? Or did they? No? They didn't, did they? Ten of them said, it's going to be a hard job, we can't possibly do that. God had said, I'm taking you to the promised land. And they said, no, no, you can't. Effectively, they were saying, I don't believe you, God. You're not good enough to be able to get us into that land. We've seen the men. They were like Goliath. He was one of the giants, wasn't he? We saw yesterday. Great big people. We can't manage this. We're only little people. But two of them, Caleb and Joshua, said, yes, we can. Because God says we can. And if God says we can, we believe him. Do you know what happened in that situation? Who can tell me? Those who didn't believe died. Those who didn't believe, yes. Effectively, God said that if you don't believe me, you die in the wilderness. And over a 40-year period, they all died. All that generation, only their children went into the promised land. And of that generation, two people only went into the land, Joshua and Caleb. And that's a lesson we have to learn, don't, don't we? The ten said it can't be done. And two of them said, oh yes it can, because we've got God with us. And the ten said, oh no, we can't. But of course, they could have done if they believed God. In effect, they were saying, we don't believe that God can do it. So God kept his promise. He always does. So there's a lesson that we have to learn, isn't there? We have to learn to have faith in God, to believe in Jesus, and to live God-like lives, that's walking with Jesus, we say. Now, I want to come back to what we did earlier. Why did I choose Ben to look after my promise of a box of chocolates? Yes. Absolutely, he believed the promise. But, you see, the reason I chose Ben was because Ben has already shown that he believed that. Because, do you remember, we were all here when Ben was baptised last year. And he showed by being baptised that he believes Jesus. And so he, and, and so I was able to call Ben out and say, will you look after these for me? Right, so, so that's the pattern, you see, that follows, because that happens in Scripture. You see, although Ben isn't my son, he's recently showed by his faith that he believes God. God has entrusted to Jesus as his son our salvation and the gift of eternal life if we believe and obey him. It's a simple but very important lesson that we all have to take on board if we want to share in God's promise. 
So as soon as this meeting is finished, I hope that's the lesson that I've, I've conveyed to you, as soon as this meeting is finished, my promise to you can be kept. And you can go to Ben, and Ben will share those chocolates out amongst you, if you believe that I will do it. If you believe that there are chocolates, I've shown you, you've seen them, so you know they're there, it's up to you to have the faith to go to Ben and say, can I have the chocolates? And I'll share them out with you. If, by the way, the, the box uh, runs out, there is another box, Ben, but there are only eight of you, and I think there are 20 in that box, and the other ones, I had to save some from Richard Harper because he, he's bigger and younger than me, you see, but all the rest of you can share in the other box, which I've got in my case. But there's the lesson we learn, you see, and, and at that I'm going to conclude. It's, it's a simple part, there are loads more stuff we could talk about God's promises to us. I just wanted to make that simple point that if we want eternal life, We've got to believe God. We've got to believe Jesus. And when Jesus comes back, he will be pleased to give us a place in his kingdom. Thank you.